Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Springer and I'm the manager of customer service for the St. Joseph County Public Library. It's such an honor tonight to meet with three of the people who make Dinner and a Book for WNIT. Gail Martin is the executive producer of Dinner and a Book and the host. Brenda Bowyer is the line director, uh, line producer and director and she's behind the camera. And Doug Farmwald is a frequent co-host with Gail on the show. So we're gonna be talking tonight about Dinner in a Book, what makes it tick, the history of the show. And the reason I'm here talking about it is because One Book has been such a big part of the uh, One Book, One Michiana program that the St. Joseph County Public Library does. So um, we'll tell you a bit about that program as well. But I wanted to ask just to start off, um, can we talk about the history of Dinner in a Book? Um, how long have you guys been doing this show? It was a spinoff from one of an afternoon series that WNIT did starting in, was it 2001 or two, Doug? Or maybe it, it went on the air, Dinner in a Book went on the air at that time. Yeah, Open yeah. Studio started in 98. Okay, they, they had a little segment on that four hour show for cooking, I think, and that's how they decided to, they spun off several uh, series from that initial program on Sunday afternoon. It was on from one to four. And uh, so it's been on quite a while. 20, it, we're taping the 20th season. So that's fun. Wow. That's uh, and I have to denote myself or demote. I'm producer, not executive producer. Okay. <laughs> that was my error. Sorry about that. But she it does, all the, heavy lifting. <laughs> she does <laughs> all the heavy lifting for the show. I have to do some more work. Then. <laughs> you can ask them to call you the executive producer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, so I don't know. That's what I remember. As, and then, um, you know, and then we did the one book one from Michiana every year when you when you started that so it's been a great partnership thoroughly yeah. enjoyed. I but in the early days Chris I'll just give you a little background on our show oh, in the early days we had a kitchen set that was built for open studio so it was in we had a kitchen and a, a living room and then a a little performance area and so it was all multi-purpose and we would do all kinds of things in that show and it was a live three-hour show like Gail said and so our kitchen set it looked like a kitchen, but nothing worked in it. It was it was all nothing was hooked up. So the you you could lift the faucet up. Uh, <laughs> it would come right that, up. Off. The, it it was a real sink, but there was nothing down below. And uh, Gail used to cook on little propane burners, little camp. It was like stuff. camping outfit. Right. And yeah. two of the burners were you know serviceable one was the simmer that just simmered it never got hot even and so people used to tease me about you know is this a camping show or is it a kitchen what is it and so you know and it was fun so and then we, we had we had no water so my husband would come and pick up all the dirty dishes and take them to our house and wash them and then bring them back to the studio so it was pretty rustic yeah for sure. So when did they build you an actual working kitchen? When we moved over to, to South Bend to in the new facility or okay. the okay. facility in 2009. That's right, because you'd been in Elkhart before. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'd almost forgotten that. In the career center. And Doug actually worked at the station as well as the educational, yeah. Yeah, as a educational outreach coordinator. And so he, well, that's the position he started with. And so that's how he originally got involved with the show as well. Well, you were also a programming director. You designed, you put the Eventually. programs together. Yeah. But when so, we were doing open studio, mostly it was, I was moving guests around yes. from spot to spot, making sure everyone was at the, at the right place at the right time. It was labor intensive. <laughs> it really though. sounds like it. Yeah, but it, it was good. I mean, but it, it, it did take up a, the whole Sunday afternoon, didn't it? It, mm -hmm. it really was, um, I think, you know, and Dinner in a Book just came right out of that. And for the first year, I had the same uh, guest. He was from Topeka or Ligonier. Yeah, so Hal, I think. I think it was from Hal. Yeah, Kevin Beret was the 
Mm -hmm. the, the, they hosted it together for the first two seasons. And then after that, sort of went in another direction. And uh, Gail started uh, having different guests and different books. And it, it really evolved since then. Mm -hmm. It really has. But we've done all kinds of things production-wise, too. We had, a, we had a production manager that wanted to act out some of the scenes. And, uh, you know, somebody's dying on the floor, there's been shot, so he would shoot that in some location. And uh, I, it added more work to the, to the events. And then one season we carried all the food to some, after we made it to some place that, you know, was a foundation for the story. And then it was hot in the summer and the food would just sort of fall apart. You know, we, so we decided we wouldn't do that anymore. But we've tried a lot of different things. But and, Gail, do you remember the reenactments? We just had uh, Joe DiMaggio in our studio last week for yeah. uh, uh, the book that he was part of. Yeah, yeah. But early on when we were doing those reenactments, yeah. I remember one was Pavarotti and we had to do a Pavarotti in the studio. And this is with no budget. And then another <laughs> one with Joe was in, it was a murder mystery. It wasn't a series of short stories. And uh, uh, who was it? Um, do you remember? And it was a murder scene and he was stabbing the chicken in the kitchen. It was, um, <laughs> oh, I forget it now. I, I can't Chandler, remember. Raymond Chandler or somebody like that. I, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, and I was trying to direct in the back back of the uh, studio and they sent me out because I, that wasn't my job. I wasn't supposed to tell them what to do. <laughs> but, anyway, it's been a, it's been a it fun. Good. It's been fun. Ever Lots chat. Fun. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that is the way that things um, they change because I not then it doesn't and then you you know reiterate and make it better. So yeah, yeah, just evolves over time. So fun to watch, um, especially in the studio. I'm I'm hoping that uh, in future years we'll be back to the way it was. So do we. Well, we we could have. I think almost... I froze for a second, didn't I? Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Uh, Brenda, um, we let's see. We had a couple of near misses. I mean, setting the set on fire, and then I was mm -hmm. cooking a. Ooh, I love those stories. Yeah, uh, cooking a frittata, and that's when you turn the frittata over on the dish, uh, and then you have to flip it back in the pan, and it flipped all right, but it wasn't cooked enough. So it went all over the stove and we had a big laugh about that. And uh, there, there was, you know, I just said, what would Julia Child do? And I know what they would do. They would have set, redone the whole show, but we had some moments that were funny and, and lots of fun. Yeah, there are some. Share the story, Doug, about the, the fire in the studio with- um, Oh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Which was another one book, one machine. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And I forget what you you sautéing mushrooms, I think, if, if I recall correctly. Yes, you're right. You're right. And so I was trying to figure out what I actually could flame, because I think you just added wine, which shouldn't flame like that. That's not high enough proof, but it did. And the flames went up into oh, the yes. lights. I do remember and, that. I was there. <laughs> and I was directing. So I was in the director's booth looking, watching it happen and deciding, because I have a studio full of people and I'm deciding, do we stop down? Is anybody, is everyone safe? Should we stop down the show and restart or should we go? And it was that burst of flame that did lick the lights at the top. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it went out and Gail just handled it so wonderful. Yeah. She's like, oh, and then <laughs> and then continued on. And a, never well skipped a the beat. Television. Even though it wasn't live, it was a live event for it was a live was event, dance. yes. That was yeah. dance, right? We were making those drinks from um yep. it, it we made the gargle blaster and we were mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. mushroom, uh big portobello mushrooms that are supposed to look make them to look bad. And so we were making them to look bad. And it was just sort of hilarious. And then the flames come up and um the audience was very calm, weren't they? Yes, they well, and you, that's because you were very calm, <laughs> and you had you had six feet of flame coming out of your skillet, and you just you never you didn't drop it, you didn't freak out, you just well, we'll wait for the fire to go down, and, and then we'll go to the next step. 
<laughs> he watched it in slow motion. It, it was only six seconds, but we watched it in slow motion over and over again. <laughs> we were editing the show. But you we've won 11 titles now, right, Chris? I think that's right. I have the list here. Uh, four, six, eight. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 10 titles mm -hmm. is what I counted. Two. Yeah, four. that's right, because of last year. And the first taping was in the library and it we had a nice audience and um we had some noise i don't want to say noise let's just say it was the life of the library people were coming and going you know and um uh, and it was fun it was fun but it was a little tricky with the noise and as I, and we were kind of talking the other night when the library is back up and open downtown it would be fun to do another one that would in, be great in the, in the in the new auditorium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. You might be on a propane burner again, though. <laughs> well, I I won't add any whiskey or brandy. We'll have no fire, no matches. We'll be okay. So I'm I'm looking back at the list of books that we've done for one book, you know, and you're always just really um, great to agree to do this and come up with some dishes have any of the titles we've done been particularly challenging you know yes. you mentioned uh, hitchhiker's guide and that was probably a challenge but were there other ones that were were tough yes we talked about that doug wasn't it frankenstein we, i think frankenstein was the most difficult because yeah. we can always look at the title you know is there a cuisine that goes with the, you know, the milieu with the setting. So, you know, for true grit, it's cowboy food. Okay, we can figure that out. Frankenstein set in Switzerland. And aside from fondue, people don't associate much of any cuisine with Switzerland. Um, so we had to, had to research that. And we always research recipes anyway. Mm -hmm. um, for example, for this one, uh, the recipes that we think mostly came out of an 1888 cookbook. So it was contemporaneous with, with the setting. But the, the Swiss cuisine for Frankenstein was probably the one that took the most research to find something. You did a rosti, the potato mm -hmm. rosti, and I did some kind of meat dish with cream and mushrooms, very Swiss, Swiss, <laughs> uh, and, and it was tasty. But, you know, who was it that was wandering around in Switzerland? It wasn't the monster, was it? Well, it was, uh, yes, it was the because the Frankenstein family lived in switzerland so the right on lake geneva and so many of the murders that the monster committed were on the shore of lake geneva yes so yeah. it, it, that was uh, and even um sherlock but we found that yeah rusty, what do you call that a leg of roast cold roast for Sunday mm -hmm. evening, we did that, which is a very typical English thing at the time, anyway, to have and a leftover. very trifle. Yes, we had trifles. Well, we've had a lot of trifles. And mm -hmm. what I love is I can I can remind Gail of a show that we did a book, and she'll say, "Oh yes, we made this, this, and this." And so <laughs> was my guest, which I always find amazing over the life of the twenty years that she's able to do that. Well, mm -hmm. it was fun. I I don't know. I'm gonna still have my memory. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we really liked we liked doing that, and um, I liked Duck is so flexible and he's so well read that he could he could do them all. But there was there were a couple of times when we thought when we were doing the Hispanic program, there was a woman mm -hmm. that worked in South Bend. It made very good sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and uh, then we had when we Mo, you did Mosley Walter Mosley the. Was Devil it the Devil on the Blue Dress? dress. That was mm -hmm. Mother Sage right. and uh, Charlotte Piper. Yes, and that was apropos. Uh, and I just saw that movie on Netflix with um, Denzel Washington. It was fun to see that again after doing it for dinner for One Book, One Michiana. I think that was, wasn't that one of, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was in 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That year we had a staff day at the library and I did a presentation on Devil in a Blue Dress for the staff. And kind of, you know, wanted to get people up to speed. So understanding the plot points and the characters and stuff. 
So I went to the costume collection, the Cassidy costume collection that the South Bend School Corp has. And I got a blue dress from the 1940s and a hat and high heels. And I could not walk in the heels. So I walked into the room and I just kicked my shoes off. And I said, all right, uh, the rest of me is 1940s, but I'm going to be barefoot right now. Um, well, you know, the one with um, that you liked so much, Night Circus. We that was did, my favorite. We did oh, decorating okay. in the studio. We had we had these Christmas lights, and you mm -hmm. did a magic trick. You turned the drink from pink to purple or something, and mm -hmm. uh, we wore the colors of the circus. There was a lot of red. There was black and white striped, and then you that I just loved that magic that you did with the drink. It was perfect, um, and so we tried to you know add more. Have uh, added value to the show when we can, so that was that was fun to do. That was yeah. yeah, that was a fun one. That's one of the things that I've liked about doing these one books for Michiana is that I've come across a number of books that I probably would not have read otherwise. And the Night Circus being a great example, I don't think I would have picked that up off the shelf, but I just love that book. Well, then we did the Neil Gaiman book, mm -hmm. The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And that was magical realism as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, that was very interesting. And Which I, I like Neil Gaiman. I've read some of his books since since we did that. Mm -hmm. I think that was a book that Gail or that Doug introduced. I you. Yeah. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah. And oh, the one year we did the, I'm thinking of the dog, the curious incident of the dog in the night, but that wasn't on. One book, one Michiana, but we did. We were pretty current about what was going on, you know, and mm -hmm. try to stay on top of the new books. And um, and on that one, I did have a guest who was a psychologist, and mm. she had worked on the spectrum of autism and knew the, the quirks of children, some children with autism, and um, and soon as the show started we started taping, she changed personalities. And I said, what happened to you? And she said, all of a sudden I realized I could be seen by my colleagues, psycho child psychologists, and I don't want to appear to be funny or, you know, out of step, it's very serious. So it's interesting how guests can sometimes change because they want to give credit to their own professions. And do Wasn't it. that the road, the red show where everything was red? Red and yellow. Yeah, yeah red and yellow, because the child likes those colors. It's yeah. been a long time since I read that book. I know the cover is red, but I didn't remember that he had an affinity for those colors. Well, we did things with mustard and red sauce and red jello. We we did, we pulled out all the sh all the what stops for that one. So um it was good. Very good. Yeah, I like it. I think it's interesting as the director. So Gail, Gail, my role is Gail will, will do the research. She'll read what 60 books in a year, Gail or more. Mm -hmm. Yes. In order to settle down, to distill it down to 20 books. And she's looking for different things in a book in order to make it a, a, a good book for air. And then she matches the book with um, a co-host that would make sense to be together. And then she does all this work where she communicates with the guests and they build a, um, a talking points and they also build a menu and all of that. And then all of that work is done by the time she gives it to me. And then my only role is to make all of that TV friendly. So we'll talk through, you know, what uh, what's my role is she gives it to me, I make sure the script is in the, the teleprompter for the opening. That's the only part that's really scripted. And then she will uh, let me know what sort of action is gonna happen on her side of the cook area, the cook space. And then the guests all ask, what's the action going to be? So as a director, I can anticipate where my cameras need to be to uh, get the shots and get the action. And so we do this show in a couple of pieces. We do the, oh, the intro and the first segment, which is 10 to 12 minutes. And then we stop down and then they set up for what's going to happen in the second segment. 
and then we do the last 10 to 12 minutes of the show. And then at the very end, we typically have a, a finished segment, which is about two and a half minutes. And the, we present all the food and they sort of recap or, or talk something from the book, whether it's a favorite passage or something like that. Yes. So that's, that's, if you were watching the show, that's the pieces that we put together um, when we're editing to make it a finished show that you would see on TV. Well, and, and on you've added a lot of things since you became the director and you know, wonderful pictures, the music, you know, in True Grit, I think you had some cowboy music and some banjo music. And, you know, we there are a lot of points that Brenda finds and pulls together after she has uh, seen the script or the talking points. And, uh, uh, and adds the touches. And we have a bumper, two, two bumpers. And that's when we do the, let's take a look at these shots or let's take a look at the menu and this sort of thing. And um, right. And then they hustle the table out. We set the table up out in the studio. And um, that last two and a half minutes, we have all the food on display. And it's, it's, uh, it's fun. It really is. And some guests come with all kinds of accoutrements. I mean, we've had stuffed birds and owls and uh, lots of wildflowers um, and tennis shoes. When we did the grandma, uh -huh. the walk, grandma uh, grandma's Greenwood or Kate, she walked the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. I've seen that book. Mm -hmm. I can't think grandma of it. Gatewood. Isn't it Gatewood? Yes, I think it is. Yeah. And we had her, like an old pair of tennis shoes that she would have worn. It was just, and we had a shower curtain to put over the picnic uh, table in case she couldn't find a house to stay in. She would sleep under a picnic table with the shower curtain over and protect her from the rain. And this, it was, it was amazing. Uh, and Evie Kirkwood ha has always been good in bringing those touches in from nature. Um, and we did a, a South Korean story about the women divers. Uh, oh. And she brought in a lot of fine touches. And uh, yeah. And Lab Girl was a good one. There are a lot of, a lot yeah. of great ones that Evie has brought in from her world, which is the right. natural world, and, and, and adds her flavor to whatever book we're doing. Oh my gosh, Lab Girl is one of my favorite books. I, Wasn't I that love. wonderful? Mm, so good. Yeah. yeah. I just, you know, what I love about one book on Michiana and dinner in a book and book clubs, you know, it's just what you said, Doug, before, like people get introduced to titles that mm -hmm. they never would have found on their own, you know, right, right. they're just too many books to read in a lifetime. So most of us just kind of stick with, you know, I guess what people call their wheelhouse, but you're so mm -hmm. enriched when you, you know, kind of widen your world that way. So um, I'm trying to remember when I attended the taping of Dinner in a Book for Hitchhiker's Guide, and I can't remember if you shared the food at the end with the people in the studio audience. We generally do. We Yes, we generally do, but I don't think we did that one. I was kind of worried about the dub, double blaster gargle drink. <laughs> well, we don't share the drinks. The we drinks don't. are just for us. <laughs> 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 they had absinthe in them and whiskey and I thought we can't we better somebody could have a heart attack so we didn't we didn't do that and we had these silly looking cooked um well what did I just say those big mushrooms, mushrooms. the yeah. portobellos portobellos and they were not attractive at all and they were no, they never looked that great uh, and and so I we did share the pub nuts for anyone who wanted them oh, yeah. because we made no, a batch of those Okay. Something, else. something, the, something the, that's, that's finger food that we shared that. Yeah. Yeah. The, right. the proper menu was the Algolian Zylat burger. burger. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The vegan rhino cutlet, the galactic pub nuts, which I, I remember those were shared, and the uh, uh, gargle blaster. It, and didn't you say in that taping, Doug, that you based the burger on something from? Didn't you say that in the show that there was some or Minnesota? Okay, you kind of froze up a little bit. Could you repeat that? Yep, I did. I'm sorry. I was saying, um, wasn't the burger that you made on the Hitchhiker's Guide based on something that you made when you were a kid, like in Wisconsin or somewhere? 
Well, it's it's sort of a yeah, oh, Mi Wisconsin Minnesota regional cuisine called a juicy Lucy. <laughs> Obviously, because right. you know, the Galactors Galactic Guide or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is all alien, non Earth, non Terran food. So we had to make all that up with what we had. So mm -hmm. it's it's similar to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we've had a lot of experimentation. We've had so many shows from the South as well, and so we have a lot mm -hmm. of cornbread and sweet tea that pops up in a lot of the menus, and. Um, uh, and Irene Eskridge is very good at producing Southern food. Very good. And so is Alfred yeah. Guillaume. He from Louisiana. He's got a different cuisine. And he, he brings in the best writers from Louisiana. And uh, I've enjoyed that thoroughly. I have found that stimulating. And uh, can I ask you a question, Gail? Just to follow up. Um, you said there was a gentleman from Louisiana. Is he somewhere, someone who works with you? At WNIT? He's, re he's retired. He was the uh, chancellor or assistant chancellor at IUSB. His name is Dac Dr. Alfred Guillaume. Ah. And uh, he grew up in New Orleans. And he's very versed in the well known Louisiana writers. Uh, and uh, this year we're doing Creole Bell. We're going to uh, be taping in May. And he does crawdads and shrimp and all kinds of unusual vegetables from the South. And uh, um, it, it's always very lively. And he brings that treasure chest of Louisiana stories. And I'd like to almost do um, more states, you know, pick some states where we pull out some of the best known writers. We're doing that with Indiana writers. Bill Furstenberger and I have done Theodore Dreiser, Lou Wallace, um, all you, my mind. you did Booth Tarkington too. Oh right? yes, yes. Mm -hmm. This right. Uh, this year we taped the magnificent Ambersons. Yes. Right. And uh, last year was it the Feast of All Saints or Confederacy of Dunces you did with Alfred? Uh, uh, it was the first Feast one. Feast of All Saints. Yeah, that's right. But those are other uh, 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 Southern that Alfred has done. Yes, and I like getting these suggestions from someone that's from that region, because I could pull out something that really is not that typical of the period or the time, and he is so good at that. We did the one about, um, oh, the Creole Bell is the one where we're going to talk about, um, I think, plantation. It's a very interesting society down in Louisiana. It's such a mixture of Creole people and uh, African American and Native American. And uh, that's why I was so interested in the juiciness of that storytelling. And he could produce those writers. And I love that. So. Oh. I was going to ask you, do you have a sense of how many titles you do that are nonfiction as compared to fiction? I think I'm I have drifted more to nonfiction. Um, a, a really good fiction is, I'm kind of specific about that. I'm not into chick lit and I'm not into always the most popular book. I mm -hmm. want it to resonate with people. I want it to bring something special, a story about the people or what's going on in the state. So I get more excited about that sort of thing. And uh, we've had some good fiction. And one of my favorites is uh, Eric Larson, Devil in the White City and his latest one, um the splendid and the vile right so uh, i like him a lot so um and then i have a somebody that comes on who is really i call her an expert in american presidents and she's been to all the presidential libraries and um her name is kathy freese and she does a wonderful job with the history of what we're studying the background of it and it's like Doug, you just throw a book at him and he knows all about it. So it's, he's such a, uh, a treasure. He really is. So do you have, I'm, I'm trying to envision how you come up with your titles for dinner in a book. How far out are you planning it? I'm three to five months out. Okay. Yes. 
And this year it was different because of the, you know, we had the COVID and we would get ready to go and then we'd have to pull back. And so some of these books I've had to read two or three times. Um, and uh, I think I've, since March, I think I've read 60 books and I, I love it. I really do. Um, and the way we plan that is let's find the best book we can find. And uh, we start and the, uh, the guests help with that. Um, like you, you brought up Neil Gaiman, the house, the ocean. And PG, PG Woodhouse, I brought in one of those. Oh, yeah. did that. I, you know, that was just something that I really liked. Mm -hmm. well, you know, and I thought, well, that was the very first show I ever taped was a PG Woodhouse. And we made club sandwiches with Kevin mm -hmm. Bure. And, and all of a sudden we're on air, we have to cut these things. And they go flying everywhere. But we said, oh, well, we'll have the maid clean that up, you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, I, it was really funny. It was hilarious. And um, so we, we did it again. We did PG Woodhouse this year, again, or last year. And that was funny, very funny. Um, have you done a Jeeves and Wooster, or is it a different book by Woodhouse? We did Jeeves and Wooster, the very first program of the very first year. And then wow. this one, is it a part of a series? The one we did? Uh, it's, it's kind of a prequel. It was Smith and the City. It was one of his very early novels, very short novel. And the Smith character goes on through several of them. Okay. Um, it's, so it's not directly Jeeves and Wooster, but it's in the same universe, if you will. Yes, yes. Right. And, you know, you following the development of that character uh, played by Hugh Laurie and then Hugh Laurie kind of, you know, he becomes the doctor, he becomes house and then he plays mm -hmm. some other series. And we just sort of introduced him here with P.G. Woodhouse. and <laughs> He was in Worcester, I should say. But um, so I kind of followed his career, too. Um, and Brenda's made suggestions about books. The guests very often bring good suggestions. Irene Eskridge brings good suggestions of Southern writers uh, and Kathy Shreve, uh brings historical novels to my attention. And no, one, DiMaggio brings the Italian oh, uh, yeah. flavored books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just did one, didn't we? It was really, it was lots of fun. A Thousand Days in Tuscany and um, you know, it's been, it's really good, but then somebody will say, or they'll write in and they'll say, oh, this is one of the best books I ever read. You should do it on dinner and a book, but it, it doesn't grab me in a way that I like to be grabbed when I'm going to do a book. Mm -hmm. And um, the same thing, sometimes people suggest a guest and they say, oh, she's a wonderful cook. And she really is, but she may not want to speak on TV very much. And so, uh, you know, we, we have all that as we're getting new people coming in and then we work with them. And then they have, I say, you're going to hate the first three minutes. And then after that, you're going to love it. And that's what usually happens. Don't you think, Brenda? Absolutely. That's what happens. Then they sort of get it. I mean, we can practice in the studio, but until we do it for real, then mm -hmm. there's that. I could see it uh, in people's face and then in their body that they're like, Oh, okay. This is how it's supposed to go. And then they relax and it's a great show. I had a guest on two weeks ago and she said, when I got back in the car and driving back to Elkhart, I felt a sense of delight after doing it. And I said, well, I'm so glad you didn't feel sick. We like so, it when guests say that. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> well, she's probably been kind of nervous before, right? Before yeah. she got there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so. But um, you know, it's a good crew working in the studio, too. I think everybody's respectful of everybody. And there is a tenor. There is an atmosphere. Don't you feel that way, too, Doug, when you come in? Oh, I, I agree. And I think that's um, you know one of the things that I like about the, the One Book, One Michiana program is the actual audience. I think some people may find that a little bit intimidating, but that actually is it's kind of easier for me because before... I guess in a previous life, I was a high school teacher. And so I like getting up in front of people and sharing things I've learned. And that's, that's what I do mm -hmm. in those episodes. So I really enjoy that. 
Um, and I don't mind cooking in front of people and I don't enjoy messing up in front of people, but I've done that a couple of times. And, you know, it's just, that's how it works in the kitchen sometimes. Well, and we've, 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 the premise behind the, the start of this series was friends cooking for fun, sharing a book and talking about it. We are not, you know, these crafted chef people that come in, you know, slicing very fast and everything just put down to the last second what's going to happen. And we like it more free floating and more exchange of ideas. And sometimes we have a whoops moment in the kitchen mm -hmm. uh, and we just carry on unless we have to start over for some reason. I did a show once where the gas ran out in the, the propane ran out in the tank and I am cooking and I had uh, Dr. Lombardo from Notre Dame with me and we're making a cod stew and all of a sudden I am stirring it and he's talking he came from uh, Connecticut and he's talking about the cod industry and he said you really let me talk a long time this time and I said it's because we had no propane and I was checking on it the food was not cooking but nobody at home knew it and uh <laughs> So we just, I just stirred the cod stew and he's talking. He said, I just loved that show. <laughs> and it wasn't until it was over that he knew why he got to talk so long. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we had a good time. I bet you know, one of the things that's... for every other show from then on, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You were so saying you were... something, Brenda, sorry. No, yeah. Doug was. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I just say I, one of the things about the show that I like is that it's not professional chefs. You know, we're right. just, we're ordinary folks. And you know, I think it shows that anybody can cook and, and cook some things well. And you don't need to always be at sort of a food channel level. That this, yes. you know, we're just, we're friends and we're cooking something that we would serve at home. <laughs> and just talking about the books as we do it. I really enjoy that. Well, that's really, you know, and I've had one or two really professional chefs and they are impeccable, but they don't like to talk when they cook. So you see, you have, you know, that aspect. Um, I had a very fine chef from Michigan and we had an excellent meal. In fact, some of us went to his restaurant the following week to try out some things, but he just didn't like to talk. He was all cooking and so you have to balance a little of that and then here gail martin starts talking the whole time and and you know it's that's not what i'm supposed to be doing and so um but we've had some really nice people on good people mm -hmm. and they bring a lot of talent uh, we did have a program on shakespeare yep. and the professor from notre dame didn't cook at all and he uh, so we chose some, I chose some items, medieval items, like a leg of chicken. And we brought out all kinds of herbs and spices, which in the Middle Ages were used to send a message to the people at the table. So I had him pulling out all the herbs and putting them in a pile and talking about what they represented. And then I had someone else that just had to practice chopping a cabbage uh, to come in and, and be on the show. I mean, it's been it's been uh, fun. It really has. Was that the one you did for Midsummer Night's Dream? That was one of our One Book and One Michiana titles, or was no, that a different one? It was long before that. Uh, I don't remember yes. the exact book, uh, but it's one of my favorite episodes because you get all this secret meaning. If if they, I don't even remember any examples, but that's. It, even though there wasn't a lot of traditional cooking, there was so much information in what they were sharing and what he was sharing with what the herbs meant and the flowers meant. I just, I mean, that's the way we kind of go in deep in some, in different ways that you would never mm -hmm. see on another cooking show. Well, I was looking at pictures from uh, the 14, 1500s artworks to see what they had on the tables. And besides luscious brocade, they had pewter and they'd have a chicken and they have apricots and they'd add nuts. So we just copied some of those picture scenes to add to this. And, and that was fun too. So well, that was Henry V, Gail. Was it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He was on several times, right? 2005. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Not Henry V. No, he wasn't on. 
<laughs> we couldn't get him on. <laughs> we couldn't get him. He was busy. <laughs> <laughs> little busy yeah <laughs> so how has dinner in a book changed during covid was there a time in this past year when you weren't shooting at all were you running reruns why don't you talk about what we you did in the studio you called me and said gail now hear this <laughs> well we the, the way our taping goes is we tape 20 episodes across the it takes 20 episodes, but we don't do those week after week after week after week. There's just, there's way too much planning and, and other things that go in the producing the show. So over the course of a year, we are taping episodes. Sometimes we do four in a month and sometimes it's only two. It depends on schedules. It depends on a lot of things. So last year during COVID would have been time that we would have been shooting in June, May and June and July and August and all the way through. Um, so we weren't able to do that. And then finally we thought, okay, if we're, we, we figured out ways, could we stopped all production in our studio and, and in actually in the field too. So we were not doing anything for a while, but because we were, uh, we were already in last year's season, we were okay. We actually had to cut last year uh, back i think we only maybe did 16 episodes out of 20 or maybe 16 or 17 right because we, could, yes. we just couldn't do anymore right our mm -hmm. new season always launches in january so we had some time for this season to catch back up once we got the green light to come into the studio so we just work on a minimal crew everybody has masks everybody including gail and guests are wearing masks until we're ready to go and then when we go, I mean, there's social distancing and everything, but we, we're very careful in how we do it, but we also, it's good not to be reminded that we're in a pandemic. And so it wouldn't make sense if we had masks on, it just wouldn't make sense. So we figured out a way in order to make it happen. We want everyone to be safe. And so then we called, I called Gail and said, okay, Gail, we're game if you are. And she said, yes, absolutely. And I explained to her how we were going to do it. And so we've been doing, I think the first one we shot, I don't even remember what month. Uh, we did one in January and then yeah. we did none in February. And then we did two in March. And then we looked at, we had like eight more shows to do. Yeah. And so soon as we could, we did, I did one a week for about six wow, weeks. Wow, to catch up so that we're, our air schedule doesn't bypass our tape schedule. Yeah. And so it, it, I think we're almost through with our eight, 20 shows. Yes. And then we've started, we will start taping for next season in May, June. Yes. Later. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want so to get I, sorry to interrupt. I was no. going to say in a, in a calendar year, is it 40 shows? Is it no. 20, and 20 or how does that work? Uh, our season it's, begins in January and it ends probably in May or early June. And then we'll repeat those episodes to the, to make a full year. And then we start again in January. So that's our air schedule. Taping schedule is year round. Uh, yes. And, uh, and, and knowing these these things that can come up or you know we've had snowstorms we've had to cancel sometimes we want to get ahead but this year it's been catch up and um, um and and we're caught up which that was i'm glad uh and we're going to start with uh, the four winds and then the creole bell and then i want to do the power of rivers because of the special that the station is working on and um yeah that'll air in september but then it'll also be part of next season shows yes that's true maybe we could show it even in september see we're, we're talking about the airing since the other show is going to be the special is going to be on but that's i don't program so i'll stay yeah, out no it will it will air that same week just like we did with hemingway Good. so hemingway was a national uh documentary series by ken burns that same week as a matter of fact i think you kicked off the Hemingway celebration. Yes, on Saturday morning. Yeah, mm -hmm. beforehand. And th then I found someone who really had been passionate about Hemingway when she was younger. 
and she had all his books and she had the secondary books and all the resources and uh and over time Hemingway has dimmed a little bit uh in the perception of people and this series done by PBS kind of pointed out some of that and uh but she she uh, she said it's time for a new Hemingway to come to come out and uh and that's that's another thing. We can do old books, mm -hmm. but there are great writers today, like Isabel Wilkinson of The Warmth of Other Suns. Oh, I love that book. I mean, oh. I I think she should be studied. That migration of the South, people coming from the South is stunning. And um she she won a Pulitzer Prize for that. Uh and she just recently wrote something. And then Cole Whitehead, too. We did his books, the Underground Railway, um, Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, I like going back to some of the older writers, but I think we should include the, the new, I don't mean just the passing, the top 10, you know, of the week that they're going to die out and disappear, but the ones that make an impact on our society, like the warmth of other sons or James Baldwin. Um, I, and I did Malcolm X this year as well. Um, there was a new book that came out about him and his, his uh, involvement with the Nation of Islam. Uh, and we did food from that era with uh, Charlotte Pfeffer, Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer and Brother Sage. Brother Sage. Um, and that was good. They, they, they're so talented. Um, and so there's always things going on all the time. And, and we were glad we got to do True Grit again, or not again, but with the One Book, One Michiana. Mm -hmm. well, uh, I'm sorry, Gail, but I was just curious, how does the library in the past come up with books? And I know recently you started voting, letting the community vote for books. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in the past, um, we started in 2010 with One Book Michiana, One Michiana. Um, we've had a committee of people from the entire library system. So I think it's been about six or seven people at different levels of the library. And they bring recommendations to each other. And then everyone reads those same books to kind of get their heads around, um, you know, what they think is the strongest book. So the elements for us, we want it to be a, a well-written book. We want it to be readable. We want people to be interested in the topic so that it's discussable. And also we want there to be opportunities to do programs around the book, not just book discussions, yeah. but possibly um, beyond dinner and a book too, um, maybe a production based on the book, maybe a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. I know when we did um, The Distance Between Us, I led a panel discussion on immigration and talked about, you know, um, what it means to be illegal. Can a human being be illegal? And we had people, um, professors from IUSB, we had an immigration rights lawyer who works in Chicago mainly. Um, she's a Latina. Uh, so several different people who were experts in their field talking about those subjects. And, you know, every book that we've done, whether it's been nonfiction or fiction, has touched on bigger issues of what it means to be human. And um, has a lot of them have a lot of great humor, um, you know, different every year. I love that, you know, we try to really mix it up. And I think you guys do that with dinner and a book as mm -hmm. well. So, well, yeah. You know, so, I Go ahead, I, sorry. No, I just wanted to say, I, at first I was kind of struck why you were doing True Grit. And, and it was my lack of background about the importance of that book. Uh, you know, in our collection of historical books that make up our country. And when I finally started going to secondary sources, I said, oh, this is a brilliant choice. Uh, and I really got into it then. And so, you know, we all get prodded once in a while to read something mm -hmm. we didn't count on reading. Uh, and so um, I, I, I really appreciate it after I did a little more study about it. And is this not the 50th anniversary of the book? Yes. 
I think that's correct. It was either um, this year or the or 2020. So I would have to look that up. But um, yeah, True Grit also was chosen by the community. So we want to be as inclusive as possible. Yes. And we had three different books that we had for people to vote between. Um, one of them was a nonfiction book, a book called Being Mortal by a, a Boston physician and writer named Atul Gawanda. He writes for The New Yorker. And it's about, you know, how do you decide um, the decisions to make as you come to the end of your life, especially if you're like his father was when he was writing this book, his father was suffering from cancer. And so, you know, so many people, we have to make those decisions either for our loved ones or ourselves. And it was just a very compassionate book, very um, moving because he was mixing all of the science and, you know, the research that he had done on medicine uh, with his own family story. So that one's great. I, if you haven't read it, I would say, please read Being Mortal. It's just so wonderful. Um, and we also had a Colson Whitehead book in the running, The Nickel Boys, yes. uh, okay. mm -hmm. which had won the Pulitzer, I think a couple of years ago. Um, and that's a difficult book to read, but a really meaningful book. It's fiction about a boys school in Florida where there are a lot of um, abuse is happening there in the school. So it's based on a, a true story, historical fiction. And then True Grit, of course, won. So, yeah. Well, I did appreciate it. And, and a couple of the books I had never read. And I, you know, I had to kind of sit down and say, okay, now you're going to read um, Sherlock Holmes. And, and I read about what to look for when Sherlock is in his disguises. And I, you know, tried to find things that would pull me into Sherlock and how the writer had used all these disguises. And I got into it then. Uh, but, you know, some of them I've had to work a little bit, getting myself going. Uh, and um, my, what, my very favorite was The Killer Angels. Mm -hmm. I had not read that mm -hmm. book. Oh my goodness. I almost cried in that book at, at the end of it. Uh, I, it was just overwhelming, and uh, uh, I was so glad you had chosen that one. Absolutely, I was really surprised by it when we were talking about doing that book. Um, I kept thinking, why didn't we do Cold Mountain? I don't know if you ever read that book by Charles Frazier. It's a wonderful historical yes. fiction about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a movie made about it after, but the, that book is incredible. So I asked. I can't remember if I asked our director, you know, why did you choose this Killer Angels book? And she said, you just need to read it. So I went home that weekend and I read it because I couldn't stop reading the book. And I emailed her and I said, thank you. <laughs> that yes. was just fantastic. And it, well, I me, felt. Mm -hmm. it's a book I wouldn't have picked up. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't have found it. So. Well, we think we know everything about certain periods of time and, but we don't. I don't. <laughs> Nobody does. No. And yeah. uh, I think I, you and I did that one too, Doug. Yeah, we did Killer Angels. I had read that before, but that it's still a fantastic book. Well, and you knew all the movements of the of the soldiers and what, what was going on here what, while this was going on there and about the differences in the, the gauge railroads, why the mm -hmm. South had so difficulty bringing supplies to their troops or you know particularly when they're up and closer to the north and it, you just brought in so much good information well the civil wars has always been of interest to me so i've actually been to gettysburg and walked uh the battlefield and that adds a lot to the experience of the book two of them that you guys did that i thought were profound doug and gail uh the the one about the oklahoma uh Oh, Killers yes. of the Flower Moon. One, the other yeah. one about oh. the, um, the other one is the um, uh, the girls who were uh, Radium Girls. Radium Girls. Radium. Oh. That was a difficult book. It was. It's a very good book, but yes, it it's not a happy book in any way. So that was that was a difficult one to do. It was. It was because I think we were shocked by how these women were treated, uh, mm -hmm. and how this was kept a secret from the outside world and that a lawyer came in and stood up for the women and uh, took their case to court and just 
worked so hard to get the settlements for their families. And uh, it, it was very moving, wasn't it? I, and I truly, and so was the uh, flower. The Pillars of the Flower Moon. Yes. Uh, Which I is probably, another one set in Oklahoma, like True Grit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, Oklahoma Territory in Arkansas, True Grit is really mm -hmm. um, interesting because Charles Portis grew up in that area, mm -hmm. in that part of Arkansas. So um, before we are done tonight, I want to just make a recommendation for one of our last one book programs a week from tonight, Jay Jennings, who's an expert on Charles Portis and his writing and his life is going to be speaking. That's going to be a virtual event on Zoom. So um, if folks are interested in attending that, they can register with us. Um, okay. So 6.30 next Monday, and you can learn a lot more about Charles Portis and you know his all of his works. So thank well, you. you. Know, I was so interested when he was writing for the New York Times, and I think it was New York Times, and he was sent to London, and mm -hmm. he was writing right. there. The, and he wasn't it the Herald Tribune International that he was like? Yes. Yeah. And he decided he's going to write a book, but he has to go back to Arkansas to do it. Well, his co-workers are absolutely flabbergasted that he would leave London to go back to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. But that's what he did. He wanted to write a book and he had to go where he knew the place, the people and, and the stories. And uh, I found that interesting about him. Um, so he was a character, very mm -hmm. much so. Uh, and um, the more you read about some of these writers, they are just, some of them you would probably not even know them on the street, but um, I've, been, I've been fascinated by, um, and we've, we've never done a Hemingway book, have we, Doug? No, no, we've not. And... Oh, wait, I take that back. I did do The Sun Also Rises. My guest didn't uh -huh. like the book, didn't like the book. So I had to overcome that. And so we made a lot of tapas that time. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, and so you have any ideas about next year? I don't. I know that we want to focus on an author of color, um, whether that means... Latinx or African American, um, Asian American, not sure. Um, there are a lot of wonderful books that we could do, memoirs, fiction, yes, um, historical fiction. So mm -hmm. um, we're going to be meeting soon in about a month with the committee and we'll start talking about what we want to do and uh, what we think the community would respond to. And I'll be in touch with you guys for sure because you're a key part of all that. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's sure been fun talking with you tonight. Was there anything that we forgot to cover in our conversation? Hmm. Well, yes. Yeah. You know, the one thing I would like to say is that I really appreciate this whole program through the library and through WNIT because I think it it does something so fundamental for the community. Is that it gives us a basis of a shared culture. We're all sharing in the same books. And I think that's more important today when it's so easy to be in our own bubble, that mm -hmm. we're doing something that brings us out and, and helps us share a commonality with the rest of our community. When you said that, I heard you say that a couple of weeks ago, and I said, my, that's brilliant. And, you know, and is that your reason so that we share a common culture? And is that the reason for one book, one Michiana? I think that's the biggest reason so that people start talking to each other and books allow you to do that in a deeper way. Um, I wasn't on the committee when the program started, but I'm really happy to be a part of it now. And I think that was perfectly stated what you said, Doug. Um, oh, it is. It is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That is the main goal of One Book, One Michiana, because even though um, society seems so fractured now, if people can come together and talk civilly and uh, with respect, then we've given them something that will continue into the future. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that's I think why it's, it's a perfect partnership with us and the library to just yes. extend those kinds of conversations. My background was in literature. So this is for me is full circle in my life. And yeah. I, 
thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed doing this. And, and the one book, the dinner and a book, uh, and I'm learning so much. Doug and I have talked about where we read books we never thought we would, or we think, oh, well, I'll read that at another time. And it really opens up new avenues uh, of thought. And uh, I really like that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I've been a reader my whole life, and I feel like I've had the opportunity to live how many thousands of lives in the books that I've read. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's true for most people who, who love to read or who come to it later in life and realize that they love it. So, yeah. I agree. It's an, an honor. Yeah. Thank you for doing One Book, One Michigan. We so appreciate it. Um, oh, we it adds to the community it. in our life. It really does. Thank you. Community Thank life and our personal do. lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Gail. Oh, Thank you, Doug and Brenda. It's been wonderful chatting sure. with you. Here's to All another right. 10 years, right? I'll drink to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we'll do that. <laughs> but I don't have a gargle blaster, so I, know. Gosh, darn it. I don't either. <laughs> but Gail, you have no. to finish with your traditional finish. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, good, good. Yes, yes. Good books, good food, good what, what? Good <laughs> friends, good food, good food. <laughs> Good food, good friends, good books make for a very good life. And I stand behind that. I love it. I don't know who thought of it, but it was great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Well, you guys have a good night and uh, we'll be together for more books in the future, I know. So great. Thank right. you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye. Bye.